So good morning, everyone. My name is Mike, and I'm an alcoholic. Now let's start the session by turning to the forward of the big book, which is on Roman numeral page 13. That's XIII. Okay. We're going to start on the first paragraph. It says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered, ED, recovered, from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. So the big book tells us immediately that its purpose is to show alcoholics how to recover from alcoholism. Until this book was written, there is no hope for alcoholics. Now anyone who is willing to follow the directions they have provided can recover. During this se session, we'll be reading through material in the big book and drawing from our own experiences to help us answer the following questions. Am I alcoholic? Do I need help? And am I willing to take certain actions to receive that help? Okay, let's keep those three questions in mind as we go through the work this morning. So let's begin our journey with the first step. Step one, we admit it we're powerless over alcohol, dash, that our, that our lives had become unmanageable. Surrender is essential in order to recover from alcoholism, and the first 51 pages of the big book is devoted to the first part of the surrender process, which is to admit we have a problem. It suggests that you read through these pages to find your truth with alcohol and the illness of alcoholism. The book begins by describing the physical and mental symptoms of alcoholism. Later, the book asks us to acknowledge that we're alcoholics. Before we can do this, we need to know what an alcoholic is, right? We'll be using information from the doctor's opinion, chapters 1, 2, and 3, and the first page of chapter 4 to determine this. Let's start on Roman numeral page 24 in the second paragraph. That's XXIV. It's going to be in the doctor's opinion. It's actually the second page of the doctor's opinion if you have a third edition. Okay, it says, The physician who, at our request, gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms... We who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as the mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we are maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality, or we were outright mental defectives. These things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent with some of us. <laughs> You're looking at one of them. But we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out the physical factor is incomplete. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As laymen, our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot account otherwise. Let's turn now to Roman numeral page 26, it's XXVI. We're in the first paragraph, Dr. Silkworth further describes the alcoholic's physical reaction to alcohol after it's ingested into the body. And for anyone that's not familiar with our history, Dr. Silkworth uh, is the physician that worked at Towns Hospital when Bill, when Bill Wilson was uh, going through his pinch, and actually Dr. Silkworth helped Bill to get sober. Dr. Sil Silkworth uh, gave Bill the vital information that was needed for not only for Bill to get sober, but also when Bill carried the message to Dr. Bob. All right, Bill told Dr. Bob what Dr. Silkworth had told him about how the alcoholic is different in the bodily and mental sense. Before this, nobody heard about this information. So Dr. Silkworth says, we believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomena of craving 
is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all, and once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly, astonishingly difficult to solve. Notice that Dr. Silk, Silkworth referred to our physical reaction to alcohol as an allergy. And after one drink, the phenomena of craving develops. At the time the big book was written, very little was known about why the alcoholic reacts to alcohol differently than other people. Since then, science and the medical community have discovered some things. We've learned that the body of the alcoholic is physically different. The liver and the pancreas of the alcoholic process alcohol at one-third to one-tenth the rate of the non-alcoholic's pancreas and liver. As alcohol enters the body, it breaks down into various components, one of which is acetate. We know now that acetate triggers the phenomenon of craving. In a normal drinker, the acetate moves through the system quickly and exits. But that doesn't happen in us. In us, the acetate is not processed out, so by staying in our body, it triggers a craving for a second drink. We have a second drink, putting in us two times as much acetate, and that makes us want to drink twice as much as the normal drinker. So we have another drink. Then having three times the craving as a normal drinker, we have another. You can see from that point how we have no control over how much we drink. The craving cycle has begun. Once the acetate accumulates in your body, and that begins to happen with the first drink, you will crave another if you're an alcoholic. And how many times did we think it'd be nice just to have one drink to relax, right? But you had more. Now you can see why. And this can never change if you're a real alcoholic. So let's go to the fourth paragraph on that same page. And Dr. Silkworth describes the common drinking, common drinking cycle of an alcoholic and begins to describe the second factor of the alcoholic illness. We know the first factor is the abnormal reaction of the body, the physical craving. The second factor is the mental obsession. Dr. Silkworth's going to describe the mental state of the alcoholic before we pick up the first drink. He says, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. Now see if you can identify with this. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which they see others taking with impunity. The word impunity means with no repercussions, no effects. You know, the alcoholic sits there at the bar and sees these non-alcoholic drinking drinkers taking a couple of drinks, and these non-alcoholics aren't going home crashing cars, throwing, throwing the cats and beating the wife. You know, that doesn't happen with the non-alcoholics because the alcoholic reacts differently. After they had succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, the phenomena of craving develops. The physical reaction of the body develops. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope for his recovery. If a mind didn't lie to us and tell us that it's okay to drink, we would never trigger the physical al allergy which produces the craving for more and more alcohol. So, we have an abnormal reaction of the body and an obsession of the mind which dooms us to drink again. It is important to note that the body of an alcoholic can never recover, but the mind can. That was great hope for me when I found that out. If alcoholism were solely a physical disease, then we could just stop drinking, and that would be the solution, right? How many times have you heard, just don't drink, you know? Nancy Reagan had a solution back in the 
back in the 80s. Just say no. Well, just say no doesn't work for a guy like me. Because when you tell me just say no, I say yes. Yeah. But the mental factor is why just quitting is not enough. That's why Dr. Silkwork says we need an entire psychic change. That's the change of our mind, how we react to alcohol. On page XXVII, Roman numeral 27, Dr. Silkwork says that all we have to do is follow a few simple rules and we won't have the desire for alcohol. We can never be cured, but the problem won't exist for us as long as we, we remain in fit spiritual condition. Those few simple rules Dr. Silkwork talks about are the actions we're going to take in the 12 steps to bring about the entire psychic change. Let's go to Roman numeral page 28, paragraph 1. Okay, he says, There are many situations which arise out of the phenomena of craving which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than the fight. Right? What he's talking about there is suicide. God bless you. you know? He's talking about once the phenomena of craving develops, you know, and this happens over and over and over again, and we're doomed to keep on drinking, and we're doomed to, to continue to start drinking because the obsession of the mind, some of us have no choice but to make the supreme sacrifice. That's why so many alcoholics, uh, drunk and sober, commit suicide. And that's what he's talking about in this paragraph. This concludes our readings from the doctor's opinion. During the next week, please read Chapter 1, Bill's Story. Bill W. is the New York stock analyst who is one of our co-founders. His story is a perfect example of an alcoholic. Some people have difficulty identifying with Bill because he was such a low-bottom, hopeless alcoholic. Here, as with the rest of the book, we ask that you look for similarities rather than differences. See where you can identify with Bill as he continues to use alcohol long after it has become a problem for him. Now, it was suggested to me to try to identify with the way Bill felt, the way Bill thought, and the way Bill drank. If I try to identify with Bill in those three areas, there's going to be a lot of things in his story that I'll be able to identify with. Again, the way he felt, thought, and drank. The first eight pages of Bill's story give us an example of the problem of the alcoholic. The last eight pages describe the spiritual solution that Bill follows. The only thing I'm going to read from Bill's story this morning is the first full paragraph on page eight because it describes so well what we alcoholics call our bottom. Okay, page eight, first full paragraph. Bill writes, No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Anybody identify with that? This is when Bill hits bottom. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. Now, if you felt like this in the past, then you identify with Bill. If Bill says he's a real alcoholic, then you might be too. We're going to skip chapter two. There is a solution for now, but I urge you to read it during the next week. And the only reason we're skipping around like this is so we have enough time to cover all the information and to take the steps uh, in an in an hour in each meeting. But it's imperative that you go from cover to cover in this book and read all the information. Okay, let's turn to page 30. And we're going to read the first page of chapter 3, more about alcoholism. It says, Most of us have been unwilling to admit we're real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will, be, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. 
Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. Next paragraph says, we learn that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we're alcoholics. This is the first step of recovery. The delusion that we're like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. Thanks for passing the, the basket, Kathy. We, uh, we have a seventh tradition. There are, are no dues or fees, but uh, we do need to pay rent for this church, and it covers uh, the expenses for coffee and any other conference-approved literature. And if there were to be any uh, monies left over after the donation of, uh, to the church and for the coffee and anything, there would be a contribution donated to uh, the two ser service entities, um, New Jersey Area 44, uh, the, gen the, the General Service Office in uh, South Plainfield, and also the Intergroup Office, which is uh, nearby in Union. Okay, back to the book. So in these paragraphs, the book confirms that we are different from the average non-alcoholic drinker in both the bodily and mental sense. They restate that we continue to believe in the lie that we can somehow control and enjoy our drinking. This is why this is a lie, that somehow, someday I could control and, in, and enjoy my drinking. Because when I was trying to control my drinking, I didn't enjoy it. And during the time I was enjoying my drinking, I certainly wasn't controlling it. You know, think back upon your experience. The book tells us again that if we continue to believe in the lie that our mind tells us and we continue to kill our bodies by drinking alcohol, then we're either going to go insane or die. The first step was stated in the second paragraph, and we'll be getting back to that statement in just a moment. Now let's briefly cover the examples that this chapter gives us describing the mental obsession we alcoholics have when it comes to alcohol. We're going to start with the first full paragraph on page 35. Okay. First paragraph on 35. What sort of thinking dominates an alcoholic who repeats time after time the desperate experiment of the first drink? Friends who have reasoned with him after a spree which has brought him to the point of divorce or bankruptcy, excuse me, are mystified when he walks directly into a saloon. Why does he of what he is thinking? Now the next few paragraphs and couple pages go on to describe a guy by the name of Jim. All right. And they give an example. Um, due to a lack of time, we're not going to read from the book, but I'm going to kind of encapsulize uh, Jim's story. Uh, you know, when you when you read through this, you can tell that Jim's a really nice guy. He's well liked by his friends and family. He inherited a car dealership uh, and was pretty successful for a time. Jim started drinking at uh, age 35, and a few years later was committed to an asylum. He was in touch with AA, and the old timers worked with him. They shared their stories and told Jim about the first two steps. He made a beginning but he failed to go forward with the spiritual program of action described in this book. He got drunk seven times in rapid succession. Each time, the old-timers worked with him. All right? Back then, they didn't, they didn't leave you out there just because you, you, you went in and out, in and out. You know, they continued to, to work with the wet drunk. Uh, he... He described to, Jim described to the old timers what happened to him. Basically, because he failed to go ahead with the rest of the program, he succumbed to the lie that he could drink whiskey safely, uh, and his trivial excuse was if he poured it into, if he poured booze into milk, it wouldn't hurt him on a full stomach. Because Jim didn't continue the rest of the program and take the rest of the steps, he did not have the entire psychic change that Dr. Silkworth talks about and fell victim to the lie that he could drink safely. All right. On page 37, our book describes that kind of thinking as pure insanity. All right. The text says in the first full paragraph of the page, whatever the precise definition of the word may be, we call this plain insanity. 
how could such a lack of proportion of the ability to think straight be called anything else? Now, isn't that a perfect definition to, de to describe alcoholic insanity? The lack of proportion of the ability to think straight. We can't see the truth from the false when it comes to alcohol. The insanity of alcoholism is not all those crazy things we did while we were drinking, like crashing our cars, getting arrested, and hurting other people mentally and physically. You know, what the book talks about insanity being is for us to believe in the lie that, that we can have that first drink safely. For me to believe in a lie that I can drink successfully. All right? Sure, it's crazy. Uh, those things that I did were crazy, but the real insanity is thinking we can safely drink alcohol in the first place, even after all the pain, suffering, and humiliation we've gone through. Like Dr. Silkworth said, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in the mind rather than the body. Let's wrap up our discussion of the physical and mental aspects of alcoholism by turning to the first page of Chapter 4, We Agnostics, at page 44. In the first paragraph, four lines down, the big book gives us a statement that, be, that can be turned into a question for us to answer. Okay, so we're going to try to determine if we have the mind and the body of an alcoholic. And since we're so few this morning, rather than uh, just asking uh, each person, we're just going to kind of answer this question as a group. And uh, a yes or a no will do fine. But we're, we're going to read this paragraph. Uh, go four lines down on page 44. If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably alcoholic. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. All right? So what I'm going to do now is ask this question. Uh, and this question is to help us determine if we have the mental and physical symptoms of alcoholism. All right? If when you honestly wanted to, could you quit drinking entirely by yourself? Yes or no? No. Okay. Or, when drinking, did you have little or no control over the amount you took? No. Debbie? Uh, no control, yeah. Okay. Let's go through the questions again. If when you honestly wanted to, could you quit drinking entirely by yourself? Yes or no? Could you quit by yourself when you, even when you wanted to? When you were drinking, did you were there times that you that you tried to quit? Before you came to AA, were there times that you tried to quit drinking? Okay. Were you able to quit on your own? No. Okay. Now, when drinking, did you have little or no control over the amount you took while you were drinking? You said it before. You said you, you didn't have any control over the amount. How many times did you go into a bar or liquor store or wherever you drank? And this is for everyone now. You know, and you said, well, here's my theme song. I'm just going to have a couple. Right? What happened? A six-pack or two six-packs or a quart later, I'm beating on the bar. What happened? I just walked in here to have a couple. I couldn't just have a couple. I had no control. Right? So if we all answer the, these questions to the affirmative, you know, if that be the case, the book says we're probably alcoholic. And we may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Now let's take a look at the third factor involved in the first step. This is a spiritual malady. All right? are, are we all clear on the, on, the, on the mental and physical factors? Okay. Bill, we clear? I absolutely Okay. All right. All right, we're going to look at the spiritual malady now, uh, and and this is the need for the second part of the first step, which says that our lives have become unmanageable. On page 44, the book says, when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. Let's turn to page 52. Okay. 
Let's look in the second paragraph for symptoms of a spiritual malady. And that's what we alcoholics suffer from all our lives. All right? Let's turn these statements into questions that can be answered for ourselves. These questions can be answered in the past tense, when I was drinking, or in the present tense, now, not drinking, suffering from an unmanageable spirit because of untreated alcoholism. As I read them, answer these questions for yourself to see if you had been or presently may be experiencing these symptoms in your life. First one, we were having trouble with personal relationships, and we include ourselves here. Does that apply to us? Okay. We couldn't control our emotional natures. Ever have up or down days? Does that apply? <laughs> Debbie's really identifying. We were prey, we were prey or had doubts of misery and depression. Does that apply? We couldn't make a living. They're talking about we couldn't have a successful life, no matter how hard we tried. Does that apply? We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. Ever worry about things? Is that applicable to us? We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Okay? That's on 52, right in the middle of the page. Second paragraph down. And all we did was turn those statements into questions to see if we were suffering from the second half of the first step, the unmanageable spirit. So if several of those apply to you, your life really is unmanageable, and chances are you're suffering from a malady which only a spiritual experience or a spiritual awakening will conquer. Back on page 44 in the second paragraph, the book told us that we have only two alternatives. First one is to be doomed in alcoholic death, and the second one is to live on a spiritual basis. So if your choice is to live on a spiritual basis, Rest assured that not only is a spiritual awakening possible, it is a guarantee, provided we keep an open mind and take the steps as described in the big book. We're going to begin this process of admittance with the first step. Before we do that, let's review exactly what we alcoholics suffer from. All right? If I can't drink safely because of the allergy of the body, and that's the first factor, and I can't stop drinking because of the accept uh, uh, Obsession of the mind, that's the second factor, then I'm powerless over alcohol. That's the first half of the first step. And if I suffer from symptoms of a life run on self-will uh, that are described on page 52, then my life is unmanageable. That's the third factor of the first step. On page 30, let's go back now, the big book tells us exactly what we have to do to make the admission that we're real alcoholics. Remember when we read, we learned that we had to fully concede, we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. It said the delusion that we're like other people are presently made the has to be smashed. All right. In order to smash the delusion that we're not alcoholics, I'm going to ask each of you a simple question. Are you ready to concede to your innermost self that you're powerless over alcohol? In other words, are you an alcoholic? All that is required is a yes or no answer, and I'm just going to go around the table. If you're not convinced you're alcoholic or that your life is unmanageable, please let us know. Your sponsor or any one of us um, will be willing to spend time with you this week to discuss your reservations. For those that are ready, let's take the first step together. Bill, do you concede to your innermost self that you are an alcoholic? Yes. Okay. And you? Yes. Debbie? Yes. Okay. Congratulations. Everyone answered yes, and we have all taken the first step together. Okay? It's that simple. Now that we admit it, we're alcoholics, let's look at what we have to do in order to recover. 